For the Americans, it is a ground war of ghostly images. The further they venture into this foggy infrared world, the harder it is to distinguish friend from foe. An appropriate metaphor for Pakistan's capital Islamabad, America's pivotal ally in the conflict. This is a planned monumental city, not unlike Canberra. For a nation of 135 million, it is strangely devoid of people, apart from the sandbagged soldiers now standing lonely vigil. The biggest threat here is not terrorism, but from the murky force within the Pakistan establishment itself. It is now two years since the Pakistan army seized power here in a bloodless coup, and the gates of the parliament building remain firmly locked. But there is another shadowy presence here, a so-called hidden government that even the army has trouble controlling. It is the ISI, or Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, a 10,000 strong security monolith that openly defies governments here. The ISI has allegedly been involved in drug running, political assassination and state-sponsored terrorism. It was the ISI who helped guide the Taliban to power in Afghanistan. And while Pakistan may officially have signed up with America's war on terrorism, it appears the ISI has other ideas. I am ISI. If it continues, I, I will probably go back to Afghanistan to, to stand with them and to fight with them because you know, it's, it's, it's a moral question. There, there's a genocide of the citizens going on. If, as many in Pakistan believe, America has launched a new Christian crusade, then this is the biblical Tower of Babel. Islamabad's Marriott Hotel, beacon for a thousand journalists from around the world. Their satellite links reaching towards the heavens, broadcasting in many tongues on a wall they cannot see. One figure with a clear vision is Ahmed Rashid, author, commentator and Taliban watcher. Such is his expertise on Afghan affairs that Pakistan's military rulers invited him to join the regime as a national security advisor, an offer he declined. Um, the Americans seem to be bombing more in the south than in the north of the country. Pakistan may now be America's key ally, but he warns there is a deep sense of betrayal from within the ranks of the ISI, which is now being asked to destroy what it helped create. There's a big joke, you know, in the army, in the regular army, that is that, you know, uh, many of the ISI officers are more Taliban than the Taliban. Um, now, you know, there, there's an ideological commitment there. There's a religious commitment there. There's a great feeling of anti-Americanism there. The irony is that the ISI owes its rise to power to the Americans. In the 1980s, Pakistan was a frontline state in Washington's war against communism. And the battlefield was Soviet-occupied Afghanistan. When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and the Americans started sending in billions of dollars worth of aid to the Afghan Mujahideen, the ISI became the distribution agency for those uh, military supplies, money, um, and planning ba battles inside Afghanistan for the Mujahideen. So it expanded enormously. There was very close cooperation with the CIA. In 1989, the superpowers lost interest and went home. But there was no reconstruction, no Marshall Plan for this forgotten war. An abandonment still resented bitterly by many Pakistanis. Emboldened by its Afghan adventures and flush with cash, the ISI expanded its domestic role, becoming the kingmaker of Pakistani politics. I found it to be a state within a state. I was the Prime Minister of Pakistan. And while I was the Prime Minister of Pakistan, I found ISI officials approaching my parliamentarians and asking them to defect uh, from me, asking them to vote against me. 
Benazir Bhutto is in Washington, warning the Americans to be extremely cautious of their new Pakistani intelligence allies. But the ISI are the eyes and ears of US forces in Afghanistan. Forced into exile amid allegations of corruption, Benazir firmly believes the agency was the instrument of her demise. In my second term, I've heard about ISI officials approaching the Chief Justice of Pakistan and offering him the interim prime ministership in case he helped topple my government. Are you ready? Good. Are you ready? Yeah. As the ISI consolidated its power at home, Afghanistan was in a state of anarchy following the Soviet departure. Out of the chaos in 1994 emerged the Taliban, then a small, obscure band of religious zealots, a group quickly talent-spotted by the ISI and anointed for greater things. The Pakistan-sponsored tanker of the entire country. Almost immediately, if you like, the ISI started supporting them and, in a sense, running them and their, their politics and their military structure and their military advances. Pakistan still officially denies direct ISI involvement with the Taliban. But now the truth is finally emerging from the shadows. Brigadier Shaukat Qadir was a senior planner at army headquarters with close links to the ISI. He left the military two years ago taking with him a detailed knowledge of the ISI's Afghan operations. I'd estimate that at the, the highest point that they reached, probably the official representatives over there would number under a thousand or so, hmm. which include some military personnel, some civilians in advisory capacity, etc., etc., you know, all kinds of people who were helping out. It was a huge operation, with the ISI spending one billion US dollars a year keeping this Taliban war machine on the road. But the Pakistani agents soon found that their protégés were out of control. I think this kind of extremism that developed over the years uh, to recently was something Pakistan would have paid money to try and avoid, but could not. I think the ISI would have exerted all its possible influence to prevent this from happening. Many of the young Taliban fighters were in fact from these religious schools or madrasas in Pakistan, secretly funded by ISI heroin smuggling operations out of Afghanistan. There was money coming into Pakistan in suitcases. This money was used by the retired generals who were then serving in ISI to set up schools. They have endowments of their own and now they can recruit and train and uh, do what they want independently. The taxi driver's tour of Islamabad takes you past the grand facades of Parliament and the courts. But the real power rests just down the road, along Kayabani Suahari Avenue, at the ISI's sprawling headquarters. Behind these walls lies the hidden government, an intelligence agency nominally under army command. But in reality, it has been dictating the terms on Pakistan's most sensitive policies, such as Afghanistan, Kashmir, and nuclear weapons development. Retired General Hamid Ghul ran the ISI in its Cold War heyday. He takes pride in having Islamicized the agency before being sacked by Benazir in 89, perhaps her only victory against the ISI. Now he preaches the politics of fundamentalism and claims to be the public voice of the ISI ranks. He claims the ISI is now Pakistan's moral guardian, defending the state 
against corrupt, incompetent politicians. So there's nothing wrong with the ISI interfering no, no, no. in the political it's process? No, it's the way you handle it. It's the way you handle it. It is an efficient uh, instrument. And its efficiency, it's like a, like a knife, which is sharp, which is efficient. It depends, you cut vegetable with it, or you slit somebody's throat, or you commit a harakiri with it. Anything is possible. It's the way you use it. It is the agenda of certain retired generals who then make and break governments to get their favorites appointed in the ISI and even to some extent in the judiciary and the civil administration. And then they work through these to turn Pakistan into a theocracy. Serving fundamentalist generals played a key role in the coup that brought General Pervez Musharraf to power two years ago. A few months later, we witnessed this rare gathering of the coup makers for Ramadan prayers, including Lieutenant General Mehmood Ahmed in the red cardigan, who'd just been appointed as the new ISI boss. <coughs> They prayed shoulder to shoulder, fundamentalists and the secular Musharraf, all equal before God. But here in the imperfect mortal world, General Mehmood was soon seduced by the power of the ISI. There is so much power there. There is so much ability to manipulate, to monitor, to do it do surveillance to, you know, you have such an enormous sense of power that unless you're a very, very well balanced person, I'm sure it'll go to your head. And General Mehmood, by all accounts, acted with the zeal of a convert. Following the September 11 crisis, Musharraf sent Mehmood to meet the Taliban to demand the surrender of Osama bin Laden. But Pakistan military sources have told us the ISI boss did precisely the opposite, encouraging the Taliban to tough out the coming American attacks. A few days after the September 11th bombing, several officers went back in again to help the Taliban. They were reported to be um, advising the Taliban on how to prepare their military defences uh, against the, uh, at that time, upcoming American attack. Memwood's treachery cost him dearly. On the day the Americans launched their air war in Afghanistan, General Musharraf announced his own military strike. Memwood was suddenly retired. Three other fundamentalist generals were also sidelined. Mr. President, why did you replace the head of the ISI? Well, this is a, a normal military activity. Uh, which has gone on, it has no relationship with events that are taking place. The language was typically diplomatic, but in the dangerous world of Pakistani politics, the message was clear. This was Musharraf's bid to rein in his renegade spy agency. The ISI for this period of time ran wild under Mahmood only to that sense that Mahmood had grown in arrogance. He began to believe that his authority was unchallenged, which is why he had to go, why he in fact got the sack. Musharraf may have lopped off some fundamentalist heads, but the ISI and its powerful network of retired officers remains a hydra-headed monster with extremist views. Who do you think was responsible for the for the World Trade Center and Pentagon attacks on if September 11. Yes, I think uh, it's Mossad. Mossad, along with uh, the Jewish lobbies inside America. Yet another anti-American rally, and George Bush's effigy goes up in flames. Plenty of colour and movement for the vast foreign TV hall. The cameras don't record the fact that most of these displays are engineered by extremist groups, funded and controlled by the ISI. The question is who, if anyone, has control of the so-called hidden government. General Musharraf has assured President Bush that he's now taken firm command of the agency. But as the Americans continue their war on terror, 
they may well be asking themselves, with friends like the ISI, who needs enemies?